All right. So here we are. Welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Scott Miller. I'm going to be your instructor tonight. I'm based in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, teaching the LSAT is kind of my main full-time gig right now. It's the main thing that I do is teach classes for the LSAT. I do private tutoring for Manhattan Prep. Um, so yeah, I, I really like the LSAT. I think it's a fun test. I think it's an interesting test. It's easy to say that now that I've taken it and gotten it behind me and I got the score that I wanted and needed. Um, but really it is. And I hope that, that some of you who've been studying or were just starting in your studies, at some point get a little sense of that too and have a little fun with this. Um, it is a really interesting test and, um, and you can have a little fun with it uh, if you let yourself. But it is hard work, right? Preparing for the LSAT is hard work. We're not gonna, not gonna downplay that. In terms of our topic for tonight, um, we are going to talk about the reading comprehension section. And uh, this is a section that there are a lot of different opinions about. A lot of people uh, are looking for help in this section. In fact, you know, you had an opportunity, those who are attending live tonight, um, who are attending the session live, uh, you may have gotten an email from our student services team with a link to a survey where you can enter a question. And the questions that we had were about reading comprehension tonight. So this is convenient because that's what we're planning to talk about. Um, before we get into this, just a little bit of a, of a like commercial, I guess, maybe public service announcement. So in addition to these free prep hours that, that we run uh, twice a month, we do these twice a month, um, we also have a lot of really good free resources on our website. So uh, you can go and I'll put uh, links to a couple. I'll give you a couple links in the chat window at the end of this session if you're here live. If you're watching the recording, then in the uh, description and comment or the description for the YouTube video, you should see links to our website and some free resources. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to check those out. Um, you can take one of our LSAT classes. You can take session one for free. Uh, we call it a trial class. So you can just you know register for just session one. You don't have to pay anything. Check out the class, see what you think. Um, and, you know, you get, a, you get an idea of what our classes are about, but even if you don't decide to continue with the whole class, you get some great information and introduction to the LSAT and introduction to some different concepts, um, kind of like these free prep hours. So with that being said, with the little uh, commercial or public service announcement out of the way, like I said, we're going to talk about reading comprehension. Um, I'm curious, again, for the people who are here live with us tonight in the chat window, let me know what your thoughts are. Can you explain in a, th a few words in the chat window? Um, what do you think about reading comprehension? How do you feel about it? What have you heard about it? What do you know about it? A few words. It is boring. Not the most riveting things you've ever read. Huh? The worst. Okay. It's the hardest section. Wonder if I can skip worrying about this and just focus on the other parts. That's an interesting comment. I'm wondering if I can skip worrying about this and just focus on the other parts. Um, I'm going to comment on that for a second. Some people do, you know, have that idea. Some people have it about logic games. Like, really, do I have to do the logic game section? Can't I just do the other sections? I mean, it depends on what score you want. If you're really looking for anything in the 160s or 170s, then it's going to be really hard for you to skip one section and just focus on the others. Um, you know, regardless of what score you're shooting for, it's really, I don't recommend that you just focus on two sections and ignore the one that's most difficult for you because you're putting all your eggs in one basket in that case. And, you know, even though you can focus your studies more on the other two sections, on test day, you want to have as many different possibilities to get your score as possible. And I think, you know, ignoring any one section is really very limiting. So it's not something I recommend. Um, good. I see. Well, I see some people sharing thoughts. I see some people sharing ideas. Uh, people want to focus on the key parts of the passage rather than getting bogged down in the details. Marissa, that is so important. That's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, it's interesting that Kaylee, you're saying it's the hardest section. Um, or Johnny, you're saying deceivingly difficult at times. So it's really interesting because um, it's actually something that we find pretty commonly with reading comprehension. There are kind of two schools of, of thought about reading comprehension or two common ideas that we run into. Um, one of the ideas that we run into or that people have, especially when they first go into the LSAT or they first start preparing, is people say, oh, it's reading comprehension. Like I know how to read. This isn't gonna be hard, right? I could do this. I don't have to worry about reading comprehension. In fact, some people, when they're preparing, especially if they're preparing on their own, self-studying, um, they kind of blow off the reading comprehension section. 
and they don't really spend any time on it. And then they get to the actual LSAT and go, whoa, what is this? This is not like, you know, the normal reading comprehension that I've seen. Uh, so it can be surprisingly difficult. The other school of thought, kind of the opposite end, uh, you know, the, the one side is, oh, this is just going to be easy. I don't really need to worry about it. I know how to read. The other school of thought that we run into a lot is that it is really difficult and you actually can't improve much in it. Like a lot of people think you're, you're, whatever score you get when you take your first practice test, whatever you get in reading comprehension is what you're going to get because it's testing these reading skills that you either have or you don't and you know you can't really improve so i'm gonna um kind of poo poo both those ideas um it is you know so one you do have to take it seriously right even though yeah you know how to read you've probably taken a lot of reading comprehension tests of various forms in your life lsat reading comprehension can be very different from other types of reading comprehension tests and other types of reading that you've maybe done in your life and so you need to really consider, you know, what exactly is LSAT reading comprehension testing and what do you need to know to do well in the section? But the other side is you, you can learn to do better in this section, just like you can learn to do better in any section of the LSAT. It is very possible to improve because what it's doing is testing very specific skills. LSAT reading comprehension, like every other section of the LSAT, is testing a very specific set of skills and it's designed to evaluate how well you're likely to do in, in your first year of law school and beyond. So these are, these are specific skills that have been found to be useful in law school and in your career as a lawyer. So let's talk about what those skills are and what specifically the LSAT reading comprehension section is testing and how we can get better at it. Um, we're gonna go through a few things. We're definitely gonna focus on, re on improving your ability to read for the LSAT. Read specifically the way the LSAT is expecting you to read. Um, the specific type of reading and, and comprehension that we're looking for. We're also going to talk about mastering RC questions. So we'll try to get into the questions a little bit. And we're going to talk about this all in a way that's very focused on uh, reading comprehension in the digital LSAT. Um, in fact, this is in some ways a repeat. I'm going to admit as kind of a caveat. Um, I did it. I'd, actually, it was a year ago today that I did a free prep hour on this topic, reading comprehension. And this is, if you've already seen that one, I'm going to be honest, this is maybe some of this is going to be a bit of a review. That's okay. Review is pretty good. Seeing things multiple times can be helpful. Um, but we're definitely going to tailor this lesson today for the digital LSAT, which if you're taking the LSAT in North America, you are going to be getting the digital version. Um, starting, they started, you know, kind of half and half with the half and half thing back in July. And now from September forward, all LSATs in North America are going to be digital. So we'll talk about specific, you know, some things that are specific to the digital test and how to get the most out of um, the resources that you have to use, including paper tests. So let's dive in. Um, we'll start by talking about improving your ability to read for the LSAT. So what I'm going to do is show you the first paragraph of a reading comprehension passage. And I'm gonna give everybody a minute to read this first paragraph. So let's go ahead and do that, please. Read this first paragraph. Okay, maybe that was a little bit less than a minute, but that's okay. What I'd like everyone to do in the chat window, if you would, uh, for those of you who are here live tonight, in the chat window, let me know, give me, um, if you were to pick like one part of this paragraph, a single line or a single sentence that you consider the most important. If, like if I was to say, highlight the, a, a single line or a single sentence in this paragraph that you think is the most important thing, what would that be? Give me like line numbers, like we have line numbers over here on the side, or just give me the first couple words of the sentence or the line that you would highlight. If I said highlight the thing in here that you think is most important. Okay, I see some answers in the chat window coming in. OK, 
Okay. I see a lot of people focusing in on this, uh, what we have right in here. So a lot of people are focusing in on uh, such documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best. And I think that's a pretty good candidate. Um, you know, we start off talking about the, you know, the tra tracing the changing face of the Irish landscape. What scholars have traditionally relied primarily on is evidence from historical documents. We get this, however, this pivot, such documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best. And what is the rest of the, you know, so what is the rest of this paragraph doing? For people who said they think this is what's most important, what is the rest of the paragraph doing then? How does the rest of the paragraph relate to that line that we just highlighted? I see people saying premise, validating it. Yeah, there's kind of an argument here, right? This is a conclusion. Such documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best. It's an opinion, right? And the rest of this is, is, is providing support for that opinion. So opinions are really important on the LSAT. We want to pay attention to opinions. A lot of the questions are going to ask you either directly or indirectly about opinions. Um, do we know, do we have any idea whose opinion this is? Like, it sounds like an opinion. Such documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best. Really, do they? I don't know. Whose opinion is it? Do we have any idea who thinks this? Have we been given any indication of that? Marissa says the author. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, Marissa, you don't have to do this if you want, but uh, I'm going to give you a chance to get on the mic if you want. Um, there should be a little uh, talk button or unmute button down in the lower left corner of your screen down here. So if you want, if you don't want to, that's fine. Just let me know in the chat window. But if you want to, can you hop on the mic, unmute yourself, and tell me, why do you, why, how do we know that that's the author's opinion? And if you don't want to get on the mic, you can just put, like, don't want to talk on the, in the chat window. And Marissa, I see that you unmuted your mic, but I can't actually hear you. So maybe like the microphone on your computer or something is muted. And click the unmute button again. Okay, what about now? I can hear you now, excellent. So Marissa, thank you for getting on the microphone. Tell me, how do you know this is the author's opinion? Uh, well, so they're not referencing any other speaker. Uh, and, uh, the voice like of the of the passage is in the author's like tone up until this point so normally i assume when i'm reading it that it's the author unless they like otherwise signal that someone else someone else's opinion is being represented yeah that's basically it right so if you see an opinion and it's not attributed to anybody else it doesn't say you know many scholars think that the documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best or the you know I don't know, the president of the Irish Farming Federation thinks this, you know, like we, it's not attributed to anyone else. So it must be the opinion of the person who wrote this. And we always want to notice that. We always want to notice opinions like that because they're important. A lot of the questions are going to ask you about the author's opinion, not just any opinion, but the author's opinion. So yeah, that's the author's opinion. We also want to notice, is anybody familiar with the concept of scale? We use this, if you've taken a course with us, or if you've done our LSAT Interact, or maybe gotten the brief emails, um, does anybody know what scale means when we talk about the scale? Anybody have an idea of what that's all about in the chat window? Okay. People are saying, nope, tell us, tell us, Scott, what is this scale you speak of? So notice that there are two sides being presented here. We have what scholars have traditionally relied upon, which is the historical documents. And then we have this pivot, however, and the author saying the documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best. So scholars are relying on these things, but however, they're not really helpful. That's what we're going to see in a lot of different, yeah, Johnny, the two sides, right? So a lot of these LSAT passages present two sides, two sides, two different ideas, two contrasting ideas. Um, and that's what we call the scale. 
So you want to notice that it's really, it's, it, I would say it's especially important to notice in this paragraph, this opinion starting on line three, however, such documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best, because that's the main point of the whole paragraph, right? But it's also good to notice, it's also worthwhile noticing that this, there's a contrasting idea here that the scholars have relied on historical documents. Um, you're going to see this over and over again in LSAT passages, this two-sided structure. Does anybody have an idea why? Does anybody, I'm curious in the chat window, does anybody have an idea why so many LSAT passages present, or in reading comprehension, present like two sides or two different views? And the questions are testing your ability to keep track of those two views and who has which view. Why would that be important on the LSAT? Hmm. Yeah, I can see some good answers coming in the chat window. Yeah, what, when you're a lawyer someday, or a judge someday, depending on where your career takes you, or just in law school, what are you going to be reading? You're going to be reading case briefs, you're going to be reading contracts, a lot of things that lawyers read have this two sided structure. So LSAT reading comprehension, to a great extent is testing your ability to keep track of the overall structure. You know, if there are two sides, what are the two sides? If there are opinions that are definitely in one camp or the other, then what are those opinions and whose opinions are they? And then what, you know, what support is, 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 is being given? So that's really, you know, LSAT reading comprehension in a nutshell. We talk a lot about the scale, this idea of a scale, but what it really is and what it comes down to is keeping track of, it's a way to understand the main point of the passage. Scale is a way to understand the main point of the passage. So, um, and keep that in mind too. Like, you know, some people get a little bit too hung up on this idea. Like once we talk about this, oh, there are, there are two sides. There aren't always gonna be two sides in every passage. It's common, but not, you know, 100% guaranteed. Um, it's important to notice when there is, but the main thing that, that you, know, you should always keep in mind when you think about the scale is it's a way of understanding the main point. Because generally when we talk about the scale, one side of the scale is the main point of the passage as a whole. And if the author gives an opinion, then almost always we would wanna put the author on one side or the other. Almost always the author's opinion is a pivotal part of the scale. All right, so that's the first paragraph. Um, let's keep going with this. So, Again, if I was highlighting, if I was highlighting, you know, what I thought was the most important part of this passage, I might highlight like a few of these words. I might just highlight this whole, you know, first couple lines, or I might just highlight the, the sentence beginning with however. Like that's really the big opinion in there. Um, any of these would be, would be you know, good answers. So um, does anybody know what pair means when we talk about pair? Again, this may not be something you're familiar with. It's a term that we use at Manhattan Prep. Does anybody uh, um, know what pair is? And I actually, Petra, I just saw your question in the chat window. So while people are thinking about pair, and let me know in the chat window if you know about pair, I'm going to answer your question, Petra. Uh, does main point equal neutral or not necessarily? No, the main point is not necessarily a neutral point. The main point may be a very, very strong opinion from someone like the author. This author seems to have an opinion that these documents, you know, are only a fragmentary record at best. Okay, so let me tell you what pair is. Pair is a process that we encourage people to use every time you're reading a reading comprehension passage. It stands for pause, evaluate, anticipate, and repeat. It's what we just did. So when we paused for a second to just talk about the first paragraph and identify like what is the, the main point here? What's the most important thing going on in this paragraph that we want you the main point of the paragraph as a whole that's what pair is all about and we encourage you to do this every time you read a reading comprehension passage at the end of each paragraph or in the middle of a long paragraph pause for a second evaluate think about what you just read and try to identify what is the main point here can i identify even like a sentence or a couple lines or even a few words that encapsulate or capture the main point, main topic, main idea of that paragraph. Okay, so that's what pair is all about. Pause, evaluate, like we just did. Anticipate is um, thinking what comes next. 
And it's actually a pretty useful, like somebody said boring, like when we talked about what's difficult about reading comprehension, somebody said these passages are boring. So the, um, they can be, and a really good way to, and the question people ask is how do I keep myself from just like zoning out while I'm reading them? So you can play a game. You can turn this into a game. When you get to the end of each paragraph, pause for a second and think what is going to happen next? What do I think is going to happen in the next paragraph before you even start reading? And it's a way to like, you know, keep yourself engaged so, because now you made a guess about what's going to happen in the next paragraph. And so now you want to see whether you're right or not. That's what we mean by anticipate. Um, I actually changed this a little bit. For me, it's a different game. It's pause, evaluate, and my A is annotate. So what that means is, you know, I, I, I don't take a lot of notes when I'm reading. Um, and we're going to talk about note taking and specifically note taking on the digital LSAT because it's a little different from what you do on paper. But uh, I don't take a lot of notes when I read passages. But if I do, it's I wait till the end of the paragraph. And this is what we encourage everyone to do. Wait till the end of the paragraph before you take any notes at all. Um, why would we wait till the end of a paragraph to annotate? Why not do it while you're reading? Any ideas? And Kaylee, I see your question. I'm going to answer your question in a second. What do you, do you anybody see any benefits? So you don't distract yourself. Yeah, it's a good answer. And because people annotate too much if they don't, right? It's really easy. Before you get to the end of the paragraph, you may not know what's important. You may not really have an idea of what, of what out of what you're reading is important. So people tend to annotate like every other word anything that looks important. When you get to the end of the paragraph, you can pause for a second and go, okay, what was the main point? And just like we did, zero in on one specific line or one specific sentence that you think captures the main point. So you annotate less and your annotations are more effective. If you do it, you wait till the end of the paragraph or like I said, in the middle of a really long paragraph. So Kaylee said, you know, if I'm already short on time and reading comprehension, should I use the time to pause and annotate and pause frequently when annotating and reading the passage? So, you know, it's not necessarily frequently. We're encouraging you to do it at the end of every paragraph. So, you know, maybe two, three, four times, you know, four or five times. Some, some, paragraph, some passages are four or five paragraphs long. Some are only three paragraphs long. So you're, you're, you're doing it a few times, yes. And Kaylee, I would say if you're already short on time, Absolutely, this is useful because the reason we do this is because it'll help you focus more on what's important in the passage and it will help you answer questions more effectively. One of the biggest mistakes that people make on the LSAT is thinking that they have to go really fast all the time and go at top speed. And what happens is people, like a perfect example is RC, people will read really fast and just not comprehend it all. So you're just zoom, 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 reading through the passage and you're not really getting much out of it. So then when you go to answer the questions, you struggle with the questions. Pair is a way to throttle yourself back a little bit, to actually slow yourself down a little bit and make yourself, you know, think about what's important in what you just read. So that when you go to answer the questions, you have a better idea of, of what the passage was all about. So it's actually, it's intended to slow you down a little bit and prevent you from just zooming through the passage with no real comprehension. Um, how long should we spend and how much time should we write when using pair? Very little. It's just a brief, brief, brief pause. Long enough to glance at and identify like what you think is the main point of the, of the paragraph. And then, you know, the anticipate is not, hmm, what do I think, you know, don't spend five minutes wondering what's going to happen next. What, the way I describe it is like the word association game. So when you anticipate, it's um, like if I say chocolate, what do you think? Maybe you're thinking vanilla. Maybe you're thinking ice cream, right? It's whatever pops into your head first. So if you're going to anticipate just, you know, what do I think is going to happen next? And whatever pops into your head instantly in that moment is good enough. And then you move on and read the next paragraph. Um, if you're going to annotate again, annotation should be really brief. You shouldn't necessarily have to annotate that much. So that's not going to take much time either. And again, the reason we're doing this is because you're investing time in the right things, not just blazing through this and not really getting much out of it. So let's read this paragraph, second paragraph of this passage. Let's go ahead and read this. And again, read through, pause, evaluate what you just read, and identify what you think is the main point.
So did anybody find this paragraph a little more confusing, a little more difficult? Give me a yes or no in the chat window if you found this more confusing or difficult than the last one. Okay, so a lot of people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. If you said no, fantastic. Um, but I want to help the people who are saying yes, because even if you said no to this paragraph, you're going to maybe every once in a while run into a paragraph that you find confusing when you're reading. So how do we deal with that? Um, keep in mind that, you know, you're going to personalize your reading strategy a little bit to what works for you and also to the passage. Like not every passage on the LSAT is equally equal in terms of difficulty, right? Some passages are more difficult than others. So there may be passages you read that are just like pretty easy for you to understand, others that are more difficult. So if you're understanding the paragraph, then go ahead, just read it, and then pause at the end, reflect on the main point, see if you notice any opinions like the author's opinion, and basically just say, what was the main point of this paragraph? What's the main idea of this paragraph? And why is it there? How does it relate to what I just read? That's really what we're focusing on when we pause and evaluate at the end of each paragraph. What's the main idea here in this paragraph? How does it relate to the passage as a whole as I understand it at this point? Now, if you're not understanding, then what can help is to actually slow down and, and what I say is pair individual sentences. So you read the first sentence and you go, ooh, what the heck's going on here, right? So like, I want you to try and do this. I want you to read each sentence again, but really like pause at the end of each sentence and think, for a second and then move on to the next one. So we're gonna read this again and I want everybody to try this. Like try, try pausing a little bit at the end of each sentence. So if I was to ask you now, what do you think is, you know, I've, same question I asked you before. If I was to ask you to highlight like the most important part of this paragraph, what line, what sentence, maybe two lines, maybe three lines, maybe one line, what would you suggest that we highlight as like the main topic, the main idea here? Which, which line, which sentence do you think captures the main idea? Okay, so we have some votes for this one. Studies of fossilized pollen grains, of fossilized pollen grains preserved in peat and lake muds provide an additional means of investigating vegetative landscape. Okay, um, some people are saying, uh, some people are saying the last few lines, and in many cases, the findings can serve to supplement or correct the documentary record. Okay. So yeah, I would, I would agree with that, right? I, I think you could make an argument for either one, honestly. I think you could make an uh, argument for this first sentence, for the last sentence, maybe a little bit of a combination of the two. So we're studying fossilized pollen grains as a, an additional way of investigating landscape change. And these fossilized pollen grains can correct documentary, documentary record. The rest of this is just kind of building on that, explaining like how that's happening right or why we're doing that that um i'm curious johnny again same thing i said to uh, marissa a little while ago um would you like to you don't have to but if you want to get on the microphone unmute your mic and i, I have another question for you a second question for you how does what we're reading in this paragraph relate to what we just read the paragraph before if you don't want to get on the mic you don't have to you can just say nope not interested in the chat window let me know but if you want to click, uh, hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, click unmute over in the corner and let me know, or just let me know in the chat window. How does this relate to what we just read? 
the paragraph we read earlier. And anybody else who wants to in the chat window, share your thoughts about that. How does this paragraph that we're reading relate to the one we just read? Yeah, how does this relate to the first paragraph that we read about Ireland? How does this paragraph we're reading now, this second paragraph, relate to the first one? Okay, um, I'm thinking that like the main way that it it's the same as the other one is that um, they're both talking about looking at samples of something to try and make to try and make something more clear. So for like in the one with Ireland, they were talking about the older um it was hard to get the correct information and this one's talking about how you can use something to get correct information on a certain topic yeah like the whole first the the main point of the first paragraph is that you know these this documentary record that we rely on these historical documents don't really provide you know only provide a fragmentary record and now we're saying well now we have another means of investigating the landscape change um, and then in the bottom, and in many ways, the findings can serve to supplement or correct the documentary record. So this is building on the point that the author made about us having a fragmentary record. And this is saying how we can correct it, how we might be able to correct the record using these fossilized pollen grains. All right, cool, great. Um, let's keep going with this. So this is what we're doing here is following this process of reading each paragraph one at a time. If you need to, if a paragraph is confusing, like you read the first sentence and you're like, whoa, what, what's going on here? It's okay to slow down a little bit. Like I said, and I, I will say this over and over again. People think that success on the LSAT is all about going fast, as fast as you can all the time. But the people who do the best know when they need to, when they can go fast and know when they need to slow down. And if you, you know, if you find you're reading something and you find a paragraph confusing, and the funny thing is, you know, I've talked to people who said, oh, I read this paragraph like four times and I didn't understand it. Did you just read it four times fast? Why not slow down a little bit and read it one time a little more slowly? Like watch yourself when you're reading and notice if you're doing that, just reading really fast, but reading things over and over and over and again and nothing's sticking. And then try slowing down a little bit and see if that helps. People often find that it does. All right, so... Um, let's do that again. And I want you to do this yourself with this paragraph. I'm going to show you the next paragraph and, you know, read it as if you're understanding it well and you just read right through. Great. But if you feel like you need to go ahead and pause a little bit at the end of each sentence, pause when you're like shifting to a new idea and think about what you just read for a second and then move on. See if slowing down a little bit, pausing a little bit at the end of each second sentence actually maybe helps your comprehension a little bit. Okay, I see some people already putting in the chat window. You know the question I'm going to ask. What's the main point here? What's the main idea here? Rallison says 30 to 32. Marissa says 30 to 32. Yeah, so this is all about now. I wonder if anybody noticed these wonderful words at the beginning of this paragraph. For example, 
Did that stand out to anybody? Did anybody see the words for example and go, oh, great. You should. I would hope you would. Because when you see the words for example, what does that mean? What, an example of what? An example of the very last thing that was talked about. So we're talking about these pollen grains being used to, you know, supplement this fragmentary historical document record. And so if you understood what you just read, if you were, you know, following along with what we've just said, as soon as you see, for example, you know what you're about to read, an example of how we use these pollen grains to correct the documentary record. And so this is all about, you know, uh, county down, uh, cereal grain pollen, and but what it all boils down to is these, this last couple lines. The pollen evidence indicates that soils must have been successfully tilled before the introduction of the plow because we didn't think that the soils were tilled until the plow was introduced in the seventh century. So because the cereal cultivation would have required tilling of the soil, pollen indicates that the soil was tilled before the introduction of the plow. It all leads up to this. It's an example that all leads up to this conclusion. For example is context. Um, Allison, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you get on the mic if you want. If you want to ask, because I'd like to know what you mean by that by uh, context. Again, you don't have to get on the mic if you don't want to, but if you want to unmute your mic and explain a little more when you say, for example, is context. Uh, and again, if you want to, just hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, click unmute, or if you want to explain a little more in the chat window, because I'd like to know what you mean by context. Um, it does give us context for understanding the rest of what we're reading. And you can tell me if I, if I explain, if I answer this correctly or not. When you see the words, for example, it tells you like exactly, it, it puts the rest of, the, of what you're about to read in context. It tells you that with the rest of what you're about to read is an example clarifying of what you just read, what we just read. All right, so let's keep doing this. I'm gonna to try to get through this passage and then see if we can talk about uh, a question or two. Um, so let's look at this next paragraph. All right, go ahead and take a look at this next paragraph. Again, I'll give you a minute to read it. So what do you think when you're ready? Johnny says, similar to the last paragraph, more support using a specific example. Yeah, and anybody who wants to in the chat window, like give me a couple line numbers for the lines that you think, line or lines that you think, you know, again, if I asked you highlight what you think is most important in this paragraph, what lines would you highlight or what words would you highlight? So, you know, Johnny's saying similar to the last paragraph, we have more support. Johnny, in the chat window, tell me more support for what using a specific example? Because I think you're right. I just want to get a little clarification. More support for what? Um, a lot of people are pointing at the uh, last few lines here, right? So we have these historians saying that this plant, flax, whatever they're talking about, was cultivated before the 18th century, but the pollen analysis indicates that it's not the case. Flax pollen was found only in deposits laid down since the 18th century. So, um, yeah, and you know, Johnny, what you're saying is correct. It's, it's another example that supports what the author was saying earlier, or the earlier points in the earlier paragraphs, that 
the documentary record is somewhat fragmentary, maybe not very reliable, but using this analysis of pollen, we can get a better understanding of what was actually happening. Historians thought this, but the pollen says that. Yeah, using the fossilized men me method mentioned a while back. Yeah, okay, great, excellent, okay. Um, let's do one more paragraph here. I'm trying to do a couple more things before our evening is up. Um, all right, so let's, uh, read this last final paragraph of this passage. All right, so got a few people saying that if I asked you to highlight something in this paragraph that you think indicates the main point, a lot of people are looking at this first sentence. There are limits to the ability of the pollen record to reflect the vegetative history of the landscape. So there are limits to the ability of the pollen record. There are limits to the pollen. I mean, you could even, if you really wanted to be sparse here, you could narrow this down to just this. There are limits to the ability of the pollen record, right? Because we see that for example, right? As soon as you see for example, you know, I mean, it must be stressed, kind of indicates this is probably an important point. For example, tells you that now, that, you know, what I'm about to read is an example of the limits and I'm continuing to read this. I wouldn't skim this. I don't, I, I read every word of every LSAT passage. Although when I see a really important point in the first sentence and I see for example, like I'm just reading and asking myself, is this just more of an example? Is this just more support for that first sentence? Yeah, this is just more support for that first sentence. Yep, just more, and that's all we have all the way through to the end, more support for the first sentence. So I had a good question in the, uh, in the chat window. Was this the first, second, third, or fourth passage in the exam section? So this is the June 2007 practice test, passage four. This is the fourth passage. Um, Something to keep in mind is the passages don't always get progressively more difficult, although there's a tendency for the passages to get more difficult as the, the section goes on. It's not always the case. Sometimes the third one is the most difficult. Sometimes the second and third ones are e equally difficult, and the fourth one is a little less difficult. But this is certainly at least a medium difficulty passage. Um, but notice how, like, what I'm asking you to do, just, you know, take your time if you need to, and focus on you know, this question, what's the main point? Pause at the end of each paragraph and ask yourself, what's the main point of this paragraph? And we're coming up with some pretty good you know, ideas here about what is going on. So yeah, like I read this first sentence, I think great, yeah, that sounds like a, an important point. For example, tells me that I'm about to read support for that first point. And then as I continue reading, that's all I'm seeing is just what looks like more support for this first point in the first sentence. So notice what we've been doing here. I said, I, I promised earlier that I would talk a little bit about the digital LSAT um, because one thing that has changed for those of you, again, taking the LSAT in North America is the LSAT is not gonna be on paper and pencil anymore. It's gonna be on a tablet, on a touchscreen Microsoft Surface tablet. And the only annotations that you will be able to make on the passage itself are highlights like we've been doing or you can underline. You can either underline or you can highlight uh, a section of text. You can underline some, some sections of texts and, and highlight other, other sections, but that's all you can do is underline or highlight. 
Um, so, so this is bothering some people because what some people have learned and what some people have, I mean, even what we used to teach students is we, you know, when the, when the test was on paper, we taught people to take notes in the, in the margins, right? So you would do like maybe some quick notes, limits to pollen, you know, support author. I know this is awful handwriting here. I'm writing fast on my tablet and it looks horrible. Um, my, my writing on the paper LSAT was just as horrible too. Any notes to myself. Um, and that's kind of an important point. I actually stopped writing out notes in the margins on the paper LSAT because I realized after a while that I didn't have to because all I had to do is, you know, if I'm really just interested in what are the main, in the main points of each paragraph, what I found myself doing after a while was just doing a little bracket or a mark around whatever lines I thought captured the main point of that paragraph. And so when the LSAT went digital and I couldn't, you know, draw pictures all over the page anymore, all I can do now is highlight or underline. I don't care. That's fine. Because what I would suggest you can do now is the same thing we've been doing for this entire passage. As you read each paragraph, you pause at the end of the paragraph, think for a moment about what you just read, evaluate, um, and then do any annotations that you want, which can basically just come down to highlighting whatever you think is the main point. Put a little splash of highlight or underline over the line or line or words that you think capture the main point. And it's a really effective way to annotate on the digital LSAT. And what you would find is if you were to look at all of those lines that we've annotated, all those lines that we've highlighted, you would have what we call a passage map. So a passage map is kind of like a directory of the passage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you could, this is something you could write out on paper if you wanted to, and you will have scratch paper to use during the test, during the, you know, when you're using the digital test, you'll have your tablet, you'll have a stylus, you'll also have a pen and scratch paper. So what some people would want to do maybe is write, you know, you can still write notes on, on scrap paper. And what some people would do is they would, you know, write out a few notes about each paragraph. This is what a passage map is. When I think a passage map is most effective is when you're writing in less than 10 words or less, five words if you can. Like these are actually longer than I would want to write if I was writing down a passage map. But can you write in five or 10 words? a brief summary of each paragraph and the main idea in each paragraph. So the first paragraph, historical documents provide fragmentary record of changing Irish landscape. Paragraph two, fossilized pollen grains provide an additional means of investigating. Paragraph three is that example where the pollen showed the soils were tilled before the plow, which contradicts the historians. Paragraph four is where the uh, flax pollen in County Down only comes from the 18th century or later. Again, contradicts the historians. And then we have that little like rollback caveat in paragraph five. But wait, so the, the fossil record is great. The pollen record is great. Fossilized pollen is great, but there are limits. So this would be a passage map. And, and what you would have if you were to look at a passage after highlighting, if you had done what we were just doing here on the screen, if you, if you had, you know, basically on your digital LSAT screen, if you had done what we were just doing here, you would find that your passage map, and I'll go ahead and do this. Um, if you were highlighting on the screen and just highlighting what you thought were the main points of each paragraph, then if you were to look at your passage, it would basically, and, and just look at what you highlighted, um, it would basically look a lot like a passage map, right? The parts that you had highlighted in the passage would be the same as the parts that you've, uh, that we've highlighted in the, or that we've listed in our passage map here on paper. So let me just do that. Um, Again, these parts that we've highlighted basically coincide with what you would write down on paper if I asked you, you know, write down the main point of each paragraph. So that's what a passage map is. A passage map is like a list of the main points of each paragraph if you were to write it out. Or if you're just highlighting the main points on the screen as you pause and evaluate each paragraph, then you end up with, you know, kind of a visual passage map here on the passage on the, 
on the digital test screen. All right, anybody have any questions at this point? If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat window, you can put them in that Q&A window. Um, how are we doing with this? Or just give me a, like in the chat window, just like give me a okay if you're getting some things out of this that you find are helpful. Give me a not sure if I'm confused. Tell me what you think about what we've been saying here. This idea of how we're reading this pair process, this idea of focusing on main points, um, this idea of what a passage map is. Passage map is just kind of a directory, your own index or directory of the passage. All right, well, let's keep going. So um, the idea here too is not just that you're getting like a list of the main points of each paragraph, but if you notice like these paragraph three and paragraph four are just kind of supporting, they are just supporting what we say in paragraph two about the fossilized grains providing an additional means of investigating that can correct the uh, historical documents. And so we can even like de-emphasize paragraph three and paragraph four a little bit and our passage map can just boil down to paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph five. And out of all these paragraphs, if I was to ask you like, which one of those do you think is the main point of the passage as a whole? You might say paragraph two. This passage is all about how the fossilized pollen grains provide an additional means of investigating history, the Irish landscape, in addition to these historical documents, but there are limits. That's a summary of what the whole passage is about, right? So again, if you're focusing on the main point of each paragraph, what I would suggest, if you're identifying the main point of each individual paragraph, what I would suggest is one of those is likely to be the main point of the passage as a whole, the main point of the entire passage. So, you know, I mean, reading is great, right? And this is what we're focusing on. What we're doing is trying to give you an idea of how to narrow your focus and have a more specific focus when you're reading to, you know, because this is what LSAT reading comprehension is all about. They're going to give you these passages with all kinds of details. But in order to answer the questions correctly, what's most effective is to understand more the main points and structure of the passage. And again, when we talk about a scale, like this kind of indicates two sides. The author is saying the fossilized pollen grains provide an additional means and can correct the historical documents versus the historical documents that maybe aren't really that complete. Those are kind of the two sides. So let's, you know, let's, let's look at where the rubber hits the road here. Let's talk about a, uh, a question. So what I'm going to do is show you a question from this passage. Which of the following most accurately expresses the main point of the passage? Which of the following most accurately expresses the main point of the passage? So does anybody have any idea pop in their head right now? Like, does anything pop it into your head? What a, what a correct answer might look like? Tell me in the chat window, like in your own words, what do you think a correct answer would be? In the chat window, what do you think a correct answer might be to this question? The main point of the passage as a whole, in your own words. Give people a minute to type. Okay, I see a couple questions in the, in the chat window too, and I'll answer those questions in a moment. Um, I see studying the fossil vegetation versus uh, maybe a better method for documenting historical landscape. Fossil grains, although they have limitations, provide an alternative means of analyzing vegetation landscape that can bolster or correct the record established by historical documents. All right, so with your uh, thoughts in mind about what a correct answer might look like, um, if you would, go ahead and look at these answer choices and just go ahead and look through them all. And in the chat window, tell me, what do you think is the correct answer? Which of these answers do you think is correct?
Okay, we're getting to the the uh, getting near the end of the session here, so I want to wrap up with a couple things. Um, so some people are saying, A, analysis of fossilized pollen is a useful means of supplementing and in some cases correcting other sources of information. You know, that's pretty much straight from those main points that we identified, that the documentary sources, the other sources of information provide a fragment, fragmentary record. In many cases, these uh, studies of fossilized pollen can serve to supplement or correct the documentary record regarding changes of the Irish landscape. So A is looking pretty good. Um, Johnny, you said you're stuck between A and E. So what do you see as the biggest difference between A and E? Do you wanna hop on the mic again, unmute yourself? What do you see as the biggest difference between A and E? Um, so I think I'm just looking at E and like it is a good answer, but like the wording is very strong when it says it's, when it says it's very, it's like in this, it's just very strongly worded in the sentence there. About what parts are, are strongly worded? Severe limited. Yeah. Do we have, is the main point, so first of all, do we have evidence that it's severely limited? I mean, what does the passage actually say about that? And even if we do, is that the main point that it's severely limited? I mean, it says there are limits. So yeah, severely limited is very strong. I'm glad that you noticed that strong language. What other strong language do we have in here? In answer choice E. Kaylee's saying cannot, yeah, cannot be used to identify plant species. That's pretty strong, right? I mean, we talk about uh, not being able to distinguish this matter from other, you know, the same plant species. Um, uh, well, and it says pollen analysis cannot identify the species, but only the genus or, uh, or family of some plants. So that really strong language, you should, you should be really suspicious of that really strong language. Cause first of all, in both of those cases, severely limited and even the cannot, neither of those are supported actually by the passage. But, you know, even if you weren't totally sure about that, that's not really what the main point is. That's kind of detracting from the idea that we want to use pollen evidence, that it's useful. I mean, answer choice E is kind of saying, well, yeah, it can be used, but you know, it's not that great. And that's not really what the, the, the main point is. So the main point, um, the answer to a main point question, if the author had an opinion, you want the correct answer to support the author's opinion. And if there is strong language in the answer choice, we want strong language that goes in the same direction as the author's opinion. So that's why noticing, like I, when I said, we really want to notice an author's opinion if it's there. We really want to be clear about what the author's opinion is. Um, and any, we, know, we were going to be suspicious of any answer choices really that go against the author's opinion unless you're being specifically asked for something that the author would disagree with. But this is asking us for the main point of the passage. So who gets to have the main point? The person who wrote this, right? The author. So we, you know, we're suspicious of E because it has strong, strong language and that strong language seems to go against the, the main point that the author was making. So A is our correct answer. Um, B, if we look at answer choice B, analysis of historical documents together with pollen evidence have led to the revision of some previously accepted hypotheses regarding changes in the Irish landscape. Does anybody see anything with B that they're kind of suspicious of that maybe doesn't look that fantastic? I mean, it's pretty good. B is a pretty, a pretty good answer. Yeah, it's not the analysis of the historical documents together with the pollen evidence that have led to the revision of the previously accepted hypotheses. It was really the pollen evidence, and that's the, the main point of the passage, is that the pollen evidence is what led to the revision. Uh, we were talking about previously accepted hypotheses, the, uh, the, what, what some, um, you know, in, in several of these paragraphs, it did talk about what, what historians thought in the past. So I'm okay with the previously accepted hypothesis, but it wasn't the analysis of historical documents together with the pollen evidence. It was really the pollen evidence that led to the revision. So answer choice A alpha is our correct answer. Um, I want to answer a couple of these questions that people asked in the chat window because um, there were some good questions. So one of the questions was, do I have any advice on how to read efficiently and work on timing? Yes. Everything that we talked about tonight 
And I really want to emphasize that because if, if you haven't gotten that idea from what we've been saying, then I, I want to make sure it's clear. Everything that we talked about tonight is precisely about being more effective and efficient. You know, and when I say things like pause at the end of each paragraph and identify the main point of the paragraph, it sounds like I'm telling you to do something that's going to take more time. But you'll find if you do this, it improves your understanding of the main points. It improves your understanding, your comprehension of the paragraph in a way that will help you answer the questions more effectively. Um, another thing that I emphasized was notice I asked you to, when we looked at this question, I had you pause first, right? Anybody notice that, that we had you pause first for a second? I asked you to, you know, tell me, what do you think an answer might be? So it's another place that we're actually slowing down a little bit can be more effective than just blazing on through. I always encourage you to, to when you read a question, pause for a second and just a second, what comes into your head? Can you answer this question based on your understanding? based on your general understanding. You know, what does it mean by the main point of the passage? Does that trigger anything for you? Some questions are gonna ask you to go back to a specific part of the passage. So maybe when you read the question, you're gonna say, oh, I just need to go back to that part of the passage first, read that part of the passage before I even look at answer choices. So, you know, everything we talked about tonight is all about timing. It's all about being more efficient and, with, and, and more effective in how you read. Being more effective is, is more efficient. It's more, it, it's, you know, rather than just reading this passage and trying to take it all in and not understanding what details are important, what aren't, we're trying to get you to prioritize and recognize that some details are more important than others. The main points, the main ideas. So you can maybe, you know, not dwell so much on things that, and, and the thing about details is you can always go back and look up details. The passage is still going to be right there in front of you when you're answering questions. So if, if a question does ask about a specific detail, you can go, and the thing about having a good passage map is you probably know where to go back and look. You know, try that with some of these questions when you're practicing reading comprehension. If a question asks you about a specific detail in the passage, before you go and answer the question, try to think, where would I look? Which paragraph would I look at to find the answer to this? Where am I going to find the, the support for the answer to this question? Um, and another question was, what's the difference between a main point and a primary purpose question? Um, they're very similar. So the main point is going to be like an expression of, if you were to ask the person, you know, what is, what do you want me to know? Like, hey, I don't, like, so Kaylee's the one that asked this question. What's the difference between main point and primary purpose questions? So if you were to ask the author of this passage, hey, I don't have time to read your essay. What do you want me to know? And the author would say, well, you know, um, analyzing uh, samples of fossilized pollen helps us correct uh, other sources of information. That's what I want. That's what the, the thing's all about, right? So that's the way that question can be answered. The primary purpose is kind of the same thing, but worded. It could be worded in a more abstract way. So primary purpose might be uh, to, to demonstrate that there is an alternative method to learning about, you know, the Irish landscape. So a pr the answer to a primary purpose question might not specifically mention pollen or historical documents, where a main point question would actually probably include, more than likely include the, the ideas that are in the main point. So I hope that answers your question, Kaylee. Good question. Um, other than pair and passage map, do you have any tips for comprehension on the science passage? Yeah, so science passages. One thing I'll say is if you go to our YouTube channel, um, it just so happens that my esteemed colleague, Dimitri Farber, another one of our LSAT instructors, really good instructor. I, I really like working with him. We've had a chance to work together a bunch of times in the past. He did a free prep hour uh, just last month on the science behind science passages, and he provides some pretty good, uh, pretty good information specifically about tackling science passages. So I would suggest that you go to our YouTube channel and check that out. And in fact, as promised, while... Um, while we're at it, um, I did mention that I was gonna um, that I was going to provide some information about free resources. So let me go ahead and do that while we're here. Um, so in the chat window, and again, if you're watching on YouTube, this information will be in the uh, 
if you're watching on YouTube, this information will be in the um, description for the video. But let me get this for the people who are here. Okay, so in the chat window, you have some links to some free resources. Um, go to our YouTube channel. You should find a link to that too, or maybe in the email that you got from Student Services. And you can check out, like I said, just, just last month, Dimitri Farber did a, 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 a free prep hour on the science behind science passages. That was like on April 26th or 29th. Um, okay, so one last uh, little set of tips I'm gonna leave you with. Um, so again, check out our free resources. Um, we have a lot of good free resources on our website that you can use. Um, other free prep hour recordings that, that get into reading comprehension and, and you know, related topics. Um, just one last little summary, one last little uh, comment I'm going to leave you with. Uh, in terms of preparing for the digital test, because I said that you know, we would talk about that. We've talked about it a little bit, but I want to kind of summarize some of these ideas. So when you're preparing for the digital LSAT, um, Go to the LSAC website. They have digital practice tests available there now. The digital tests are, I would say, semi-realistic. The screen and the format is exactly what you're going to see on, uh, you know, on the on the actual uh, Surface tablets. So the, the the look of the screen and the way the sample tests look and the way the annotation tools work is going to be like you're going to see on the. In fact, if you can do those practice tests or use those with a tablet, that's, that's a great idea. The tests are a little bit different from, they don't function exactly the same as the real LSAT. There's no experimental section, which if you're taking the LSAT, you should know what the experimental section is and why you need to prepare properly with an experimental section. Um, and the sections don't automatically advance from one to the next. So you have to be kind of disciplined in making sure that you do the sections, you know, do the first three, one after the other, don't take a, t a break until after the third section and then do the, you know, just a, a 15 minute break after the third section and then do the next section. You kind of have to force yourself to do it that way if you want it to be realistic. But the te practice test on the LSAC website give you a really good idea of how the digital test works and you can practice using the actual tools that you'll have on test day. You can still use paper tests. You know, there are lots and lots of these prep test books around that you can purchase or acquire. And, uh, you know, these, these, 80 plus, close to 90 tests that have been disclosed by LSAC, um, paper tests that you can use to prepare. When you're using paper tests, make sure you only make the annotations in the test booklet that you can make on the tablet. So you can't do freehand annotations and write in the margins of reading comp passages. You can only highlight or underline. So think about what we showed you tonight and how we focused on main points. Practice doing that. Um, anything else that you want to write would be on scratch paper. So if you do want to take a few notes, write down a few notes to yourself, maybe about the passage map or scale, uh, you want to put that on scratch paper. Uh, DR, you get, from what I've been told, an entire booklet of scrap paper. You get plenty of scrap paper. It's not just a couple sheets. You get, uh, for everything I've heard, it's more than enough to do the test. And you have scratch paper for every section, reading comprehension, logic games, and logical reasoning. Uh, and again, in the chat window, I put a, a link to our Manhattan Prep LSAT blog. Uh, go to our website, go to our blog, our LSAT blog, and we have a really good uh, overview of the digital LSAT and strategies for it and how to approach it and how to get the most out of your prep for the digital test. So folks, uh, I know we went a little bit long tonight. Thanks for anybody who stuck around. I uh, apologize for going a little long. Um, I try not to do that, but it's a free prep hour, so you got a little bit of a, a, of a few minutes of bonus time too. But thank you all for being here uh, very much. Um, good luck with your studies. Good luck with your prep. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks to everybody who's watching from home.